Welcome everyone. We're gonna hold for a couple of seconds as we welcome everyone into the webinar today. My name is Noemi Guevara and it's my pleasure as the Director of Alumni Engagement to welcome you to our next edition of the 49er Industry Chat. Before we start, I have a couple of housekeeping items. We would like to inform you that this session is being recorded and will be available on demand on our website at csub.edu forward slash alumni. You know, as this webinar um, continues, uh, we encourage you to use our Q&A box to submit any questions for our guest speaker. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Kevin Stroh. Kevin Stroh, a 2002 CSUB graduate, overcame early challenges and eventually rose to become a vice president of sales. He later transitioned into entrepreneurship, transforming a side e-commerce dropshipping venture into a multi-million dollar enterprise. At age 42, he semi-retired from the corporate world. Today, alongside his wife, Heidi, Kevin mentors and coaches business owners nationwide sharing his wealth of experience and empowering others to achieve their entrepreneurial goals. His journey underscores the power of resilience and strategic vision. Uh, and it's my honor to welcome Kevin. Thank you so much, Kevin, for joining us today. Absolutely. Pleasure to be here. So we're very excited uh, for your chat today titled How to Win in a World that Trains You to Lose. But before we get there, let's start off from the beginning. You know, I think our audience would like uh, a little background, right, of uh, of your journey, your experience, uh, maybe how you started. I know uh, you started off at a community college and then transferring into Cal State Long Beach. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was born and raised in Southern California, Orange County. Grew up here, um, you know, all over Orange County divorced parents, like a lot of us. Um, and so school was not uh, something that came easy to me. Um, I was one of those from that generation of latchkey kids where when you came home from school, you kind of fended for yourself, which was fine. But, you know, because I didn't have the structure, um, homework and, you know, all that kind of fell by the wayside. So maybe like some of us have dealt with before, you kind of get in that mindset that you're not good at certain things like math or reading or whatever, and you start to landslide um, in your studies. And so uh, about six months before graduating high school, I got kicked out of high school for various reasons. Um, one of them being I wasn't going to graduate. I, I needed to make up some credits. And I was at Tustin High School in 1996. So some of the people in this chat were like not even born yet or whatever. And uh, so our babies, <laughs> yeah, our babies, right? So uh, I ended up going to continuation school. That was a big eye opener because in those days, Tustin, Santa Ana had a big gang problem in the 90s, 80s and 90s. And so I went into a school full of gangs and drugs and uh, it was a big crossroads moment for me. Um, I had several friends that went to that school that ended up getting killed after high school because they took the wrong path. And so I ended up kind of waking up um, and getting my uh, my studies back in order, graduating and then going to uh, junior college. And so at the time when you graduate from continuation high school, you know, Harvard and Stanford were sending me letters to join their school. So <laughs> really the only, the only real option is, can, is uh, junior college. And I, I'm a big believer in junior college. I meet a lot of people that don't financially have the means. And I tell them all the time, I said, gosh, I said, one of the best things you can do is junior college because you'll have so much more opportunity to transfer out and uh, into these four-year colleges and universities. You know, they might have a 4% acceptance rate out of high schools and they might have like a 15% out of junior colleges. So it just gave me an opportunity to live at home and, you know, not be overwhelmed with the four-year experience, get my brain working again, get all that general ed done. And then, um, 
and then transfer. So my last year, I was very motivated. I didn't want to waste much more time. So I really got my credits. I always joke, my wife now had like a hundred and something credits. And because she had all these extra classes, me, I was to an actual one credit exactly what I needed to transfer. I think at the time it was 64 credits, I forget. But I remember taking circuit training weightlifting to get the one extra unit that I needed. Like I did exactly, I didn't want to waste one second of that. And my last year I took business calculus. We talked about this before the chat. I literally showed up my first day and they did a uh, refresher test. And at Hillview Continuation High School, we didn't do a lot of math. So I was like my kids, I have a 21 year old and 18 year old who's a senior in high school and a 11 year old. And I remember when they were in sixth and seventh grade, they're like, can you help me with my pre-algebra? I'm like, I can't because I never took pre-algebra. They're like, how'd you graduate college and never take pre-algebra? Anyways, that's a whole nother story. Right. <laughs> so I changed, I changed my major that day. The next day I met with a counselor, changed my major to communication studies because I could write and I did never mind speaking, as you can tell. Um, and since that day, I've spoken over 4,000 times since I graduated. So um, I have a lot of experience in the speaking world, presenting, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I transferred to Long Beach State, couldn't find parking my first day, just like all of you. I think I parked on the baseball field. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to be late to class. And um, yeah, I had two, exactly two years at Long Beach. Did uh, both winter sessions, one summer school, 15 units a semester, uh, graduated in the year 2002 and uh, as a communication studies emphasis on speech and, you know, the rest is history. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the, the general great. overview of my start. Uh, as a student now at Long Beach, did you have participate in any clubs, activities, or were there any professors that really like opened your eyes to, you know, what you might be pursuing in the future? Yeah, I did speech and debate, um, okay. which was eye opening because I thought I was a good arguer. And then I got around real debaters that were like super smart. Like, I think we were ranked number six in the country the year I was there. Like we beat Harvard in debate that year. Um, and so communication studies at Long Beach in 2001 and two was like, I, I couldn't tell you their ranking now. It could be the same, but it was super, super good. Uh, I think had, someone just told me that the debate team, I think, was second place. Emory beat them this past weekend. Yeah. But our moot core is number one. Yeah. So it's still top. You know, the, the top talent in the country. And it was when I was there. We had a, a teacher. I think it was Dr. Smith. I'm, I'm, um, and he was a Reagan speech writer, a Clinton speech writer. Mm -hmm. He was in that world. He was a superstar. And I remember him. Uh, a couple classes with him really changed the game for me. Um, and then, like I said, being on the debate team for uh, one of the the last year I was there, realizing that I knew a lot less than I thought I did. Um, so, yeah, speech and debate. Uh, we had some great teachers when I was there. 9-11 happened when I was there. So um, September 2001, uh, one, right? I mean, I was... Uh, it was my first year at Long Beach State. I mean, all those had a significant impact um, on my journey, uh, you know, in school. It was it was great. Great. And then I think, you know, that pivot, right? You graduate. Share, if you can share with us what that experience was like of finding your first job, you know, how did you navigate that? And I know now you and your wife mentor any if you could go back in time any advice that you get you want to give to our students to start to think about now as many of them start to think about graduation you know we're getting close to the fall semester we have some winter grads but in the spring in may we'll be graduating hopefully 12,000 students yeah yeah i would say for me I would say the thing that made a huge difference, and I coach a lot of people on this today because I get a lot of people in business with me that need a better job. Um, it's hard to build a secondary business when your main income source is not good and you're in survival mode, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
So I always tell people stand out. I think a lot of people, they think, oh, I just graduated college. I did it. That's kind of the peak of their, their, their career life. And what I, what I always tell people is graduating is the beginning, right? That's the starting point. And now you're in a pool, especially in Southern California, of a lot of very talented, very sharp, very successful people, um, you know, and so you need to stand out. I what I did is I figured out the industry I wanted to get in and I called companies. So I know that's less of what we're doing today in with online and everything. But I would submit my resume and then I would call. And you wouldn't believe how much people like to help you out when you call and you say, hey, listen, I sent my resume. I know they got twelve hundred resumes just like mine. Mine's not going to stand out above anybody else's. But I'd love to send an email to the hiring manager and just let them know I appreciate their time if they take an extra look at my resume. I had nine job offers when I graduated. So I had the pick of what I wanted. Um, and so it gave me more options. I meet a lot of young people now and they're like, oh, I've inter I've sent a lot of resumes, but nobody's calling me back. And I'll go back to what I said is you need to stand out, right? You're one of, I had less competition in 2002 than you do right? Your competition is even stiffer because more people are graduating than ever before. And so you need to stand out what makes you different. And just little things like that, shooting an email to the hiring manager, you know, having the guts to do that gives you a massive, massive leg up over the competition. Um, because a lot of these kids are graduating, they've never had a job, they've never worked, they've never paid their bills, their mom still folds their underwear for them. And I think a lot of people that are hiring people out of college are thinking, who's an actual adult that I can bring into my company that's going to do well? And if you're the go-getter in that group, you're going to be the first one they look at. So that would be my best advice and something that really helped me. Um, I had extra pressure. I had a baby on the way. So my girlfriend, wife of 21 years, she was seven months pregnant at my graduation. I was 23 years old when I graduated. It took me five years to get out of college. So I had the pressure of, all right, no time to screw around. I have a baby coming and he's 21 now. And so I needed to make money. I needed to get a job. And so I think it really pushed me to be less lackadaisical about getting hired out of college. I mean, I just met a girl the other day, graduated NYU like nine months ago and doesn't have a job. And I just wanted to be like, what are you doing? doing? Yeah. Everybody's hiring. Like yeah. what's taking you so long, you know? Right. So, yeah. Are you a believer in informational interviews? I've heard many students ask me about that, you know, just like you said, reaching out to the hiring managers and saying, Hey, you know, can I pick your brain? And it's just an informational interview before you actually apply. Absolutely. Uh, I wanted to get into medical sales. I went to UCI had a medical sales conference and I just went and I literally walked up to people at the event and shook their hands, told them I was graduating in six months. I was looking to get in the industry like nobody does that. Right. So standing out, getting those connections when you graduate and then later on in life, me being 45 now, you're going to live and die by your network. And so who you know, who you're connected to, who you keep connections with is going to be a major factor in your career. And so starting and getting used to that now, even if you're in engineering and you're more of an introvert type person, you need to be, you need to have good, strong connections. So if you can get those sit downs with anyone, um, whether they're hired or not, it's going to be hugely beneficial for you, I think. Right. And I love you bring up the whole network because that's a concept that we don't teach in the classroom, right? And you learn as you go. So thank you so much for bringing that up and how important it is to network and put yourself out there, right? And and search for people that, you know, might just might open the door for you, but also just share their experience of how they, they made that journey to where they're at today. 100%. Yeah, I remember I did that exact thing with a Johnson & Johnson manager when I was in my, uh, I had been about a year out of college working and I went and did the interview and I realized in that interview how far behind I was if I wanted to get in that industry. 
first person he asked his first question he asked me is who's your mentor and i was totally caught off guard totally not prepared for that i was like my dad he's like your dad can't be your mentor he's your dad like and i realized i needed mentors i needed more people in my life he asked me what books i was reading i think i just read the J one of the jfk books because i was a reader but mm -hmm. i wasn't reading the right books i wasn't purposely getting around the right people and that interview woke me up about i was probably 25 years old and i said i gotta start getting serious about this and it, it made a big difference for me and it wasn't an interview i was going to get hired from it was just an informational type meeting um so now transition i know you had a very illustrious career in the corporate sales world could you share a little bit about your time before we talk about you know your your day-to-day -to -day job today yeah so right out of college, I got in with a real estate technology startup. Um, I was looking for big resume companies. I got uh, job offers from Staples. I got job offers from um, Young's Market Liquor. I interviewed a lot at Long Beach, believe it or not. Uh, I did all the interviews at Long Beach State. At the time, it was Monster Track, and I would literally sit in the... I don't, I don't know if it was a library or where we did it, but I would be at Long Beach my senior year and I'd be sending resumes out. I was on Monster Track one day and I actually sent a resume out to this small tech startup and that's who I got hired from. Now, the funny thing is at Long Beach, my senior year, using your guys' system to send out resumes, I worked for that company for 14 years. Wow. And so I literally got there. They had, they were doing you know, probably less than a million dollars a year in revenue. And by 08, before the real estate crash, they were doing tens of millions of dollars. So from 02 to 08, it was to kind of a time in history where, you know, the market was booming. It was a great economy. And um, yeah, I ended up being there for 14 years and uh, in outside corporate sales, a lot of presenting, a lot of speaking. Uh, I had just graduated public speaking communications major. So I was literally in real estate offices. They have once a week meetings with coffee and things like that. And I would be the speaker for that um, that meet particular meeting. I'd have 20, 30 minutes to sell my product, sometimes 10 minutes. And I did ended up doing that for 14 years, um, all from that. So it's funny how, you know, these little decisions you make take you in a certain direction. Um and uh, yeah, all, all started because I was aggressive in my senior year um, at getting hired as quickly as possible. Wonderful. So and I know in our pre-call, we we're talking about you shifting from the corporate world into the stroke group, a group in 2020. So now you're founder and partner of, of this company. Can you share with us your journey as an entrepreneurial and maybe we talk about what drop shipping is? Yeah. Bit. So in 2008, we had a major market crash. The company I worked for, they all became multimillionaires. There was three owners. I watched them get rich and buy mansions and I got paid well. I was a six figure earner in my early twenties. I, you know, at 25, my wife and I bought a $700,000 house, which now would seem like a trailer um, for that cost. But back then 700 grand was a lot of money. Everybody in my neighborhood thought I was probably dealing drugs or something. Cause I was way too young to be buying a a house like that. And so we were successful. She stayed at home with the kids. Um, things were going well, but that crash in 08 came um, and it really uh, knocked the world on its butt. And, you know, I stayed with that company and things were good, but I realized right then and there that I just watched the, the owners of the company be become wealthy. And then was I going to take my thirties and forties and keep, cre keep creating wealth for somebody else? So what I figured is I would become an entrepreneur while I worked. And it's the best advice I give for everybody. I say, listen, keep your job, pay your bills, and on the side, shut your TV off and build something because there's no risk in it, right? Because even if you go bust, you still have your job, right? And so I continued to stay at that company um, while I was building something on the side, some weeks I put no energy into my side business. Some weeks I put 30 hours into it. It just depended on what I um, could offer it. The big benefits that you all need to know is um, college students is the entire system of making money is built around entrepreneurs. 
And so if you have a job and you're a W-2 income, I don't care how much money you make, all your money is going to go to taxes and inflation. So you can make a lot of money. I made millions in the corporate world, but a lot of it is going to go towards uh, that. You know, it's going to go into inflation and taxes, which is why people are stressed out right now. But if you have a business on the side, not that I'm a CPA or I can give you advice, but that 1099 is huge, huge, way bigger than you think it is, especially if you're making money. It is such a massive shift. So um, so I was building on the side and uh, when COVID hit, my business was probably making me in revenue about double what my job was paying me. So, you know, you think you know, you have, you have a, an ego now walk into work, making double on the side, which you are at that job. They're like, Hey, can you come in on Saturday? You're like, no. Um, so, <laughs> so I don't need went, to. yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, no, thanks. So, um, so yeah, I think it was just right place, right time. We put in the work, we dug the well before we needed the water from it. 2020 hit, everybody shifted their spending power online more than ever before in our business. Just like, spiraled into this like huge venture and so december 2020 i retired from the corporate world so um that was my goal all along um and i think a lot of people think oh you to to be successful you have to find some product or something it's not true you have to find the right distribution the right systems a lot of money and ongoing revenue is created with systems and um the right you know uh, a setup. It's not always necessarily just a product, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can go on YouTube right now and get all the information you want, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to turn into something, right? Um, it's it's getting around the right people, right? I said your network is where you're going to live and die by, and that that's that's what really made our business because I got around the right people and learned the right way to think um, beyond just having a regular job. Mm -hmm. So what does your typical day look like now? Um, every day is a little different. Um, my business runs on the side. So any meetings I do a lot of times are, sure, I'll do coffee in the morning, things like that. But a lot of my talks are in the evening because people have jobs. So um, my, I may talk from 8 to 10 p.m. a couple times a week. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit different than the normal world. I don't have a job. I don't have an office. I don't have employees. So I can surf when I want to go to the gym with all the old retired people at 10 AM, mm -hmm. um, take my kids to school. My little guy's still 11. So really, I really am kind of semi-retired, but I love the idea of having a purpose and a reason to get out of bed every day and running my business, coaching other business owners, um, I meet people all the time and they're like, oh, you're not at work. And I go, well, I'm always working, right? Um, there's always this, right? There's always stuff going on. But do I necessarily need to be somewhere at a given time? No, but I'm always working. There's always stuff to be done, but I get to choose how hard I work, right? And I right. think that was kind of always my goal. So when you think of being an entrepreneur, you know, I think about, you just talked about having a thing and it doesn't have to be a thing, but how do you, how did you overcome or what advice would you give to someone that says like, I have a thing, I have an idea, where do they start, right? And I know I heard people say, come up with the business plan, but what does that really mean? Yeah, yeah. I would say first and foremost, the best way to start in whatever you venture is to get around people that have created the results you want, right? And that could be a networking group. That could be an alumni event. That could be, I mean, there's never been more free information, podcasts, everything out there like there is today. Um, I remember in college, we went to the library, right? I mean, like there was no, you know, there, there was the internet in 2002, but it, we were in the library. We were, if you, you had to look things up, you know, I remember they keep the library open till 1am for finals and we'd be in the library till one. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't as free information like it is today. Right? right. So I would say the number one advice I give anyone is get, find, seek out people 
that are in the industry, if you're thinking of selling a widget, right? You need to get around people that have sold widgets before. Reach out. LinkedIn is a great tool. Um, I remember I wanted to get hired at Zillow at one point. Probably a lot of us have the Zillow app on our phone when we're looking at real estate. Right. And I literally sent Spencer Raskoff, who he's worth like $30 billion, a LinkedIn message. And he literally got back to me that day. Wow. <laughs> I was like, hey, I have a lot of experience in the industry. I'd love to connect with whoever's hiring in the Irvine office. He was like, hey, great. Yeah, absolutely. He literally opened the door to the hiring manager in the Irvine office. He's the owner of the whole company. And just because I had the guts to send him a message on LinkedIn, I mean, what was the worst that could happen, right? He could have just ignored it. Right. So I think the willingness to reach out and ask for help, you'll find that very successful people are always looking to pay it forward. Yeah, and put yourself out there, right? I think if you live in fear, I think we're our own deterrent sometimes. 100%. Yeah, our mind is our mind is the only thing really slowing us down. And we all feel that way. I think a lot of the times we think, oh, it's us. It's not true. I coach hundreds of people in my business and we all have the same fears, same doubts, but we all want the same thing, right? We all want freedom. We all want independence. We all want you know, not to be controlled in a situation that's uncontrollable, right? Um, but, you know, getting around people that have what you want, it just, it lifts the lid, right? We all have a lid on our thinking, right? Mm-hmm. And if you want that lid to go higher, you need to get around people. I heard it once before from Jim Rohn. He goes, one day in my group of millionaires that we get together once a month and talk about strategies and business ownership, we had a billionaire speak. And he goes, and all of us were like, oh, right? right? Everyone left that meeting going, we need to pull our heads out of our butt. Like, and these were all very successful people. So for us, and it's just, get, it's leveling up beyond our normal comfort zone, our friends, our family. Our, in my experience, our family, God bless them all, can be one of the biggest limiting factors in our life um, because they want us to do their their journey right quick story my dad's an investment banker graduated CSULB 1978 yeah yep and got his MBA there um and so uh he was working with a girl last year who was a doctor she was an MD and he's in finance and I and she was an intern with him so she went to medical school because she's a first generation Indian American and that's what her parents wanted her to do she became a doctor, hated it so much that finally she had the guts to tell her parents 15 years after all the schooling that she loved finance and want, didn't want to be a doctor anymore and now was working with my dad as happy as could be. And it's a good reminder, don't waste 15 years of your life doing what somebody else wants you to do. Find your path and figure it out now and have the guts to speak up and don't rely on other people to make your decisions for you. Yeah. Find your passion, right? We always talk about that. Mm-hmm. Finding your Absolutely. passion. Uh, so I do have some questions from the audience. What do you attribute your success to? Number one thing I attribute my success to is getting around the right people. For sure. Mm-hmm. Right? Right. Um, I'm sure I don't look at now all cleaned up, but I would. I ran around a rough crowd when I was young. Like I said, in that continuation school, I could have easily went the wrong way. I had several people I know go to prison for decades. I know people that were killed and I knew people that just got into the wrong things, drugs, things like that. And I ended up meeting my wife around that time. She was my girlfriend and she was from the Brady Bunch, joking, Uh, great family, parents still married. I have 10 marriages on my side of the family. She has one. And so she just was like, listen, And, uh, you know, I'm not going to be with a guy that's going to do this, this and that. She was like, so meaning I got around people that had higher expectations. So that changed the course. Then, you know, success, career, seeking out. So number one for me, and even today, is leveling up and getting around higher caliber people, right? Um, I just got back from an event in Vegas and I was around people that were at the highest levels of what I do. And that just kind of lifts the lid on the way you think. So, yeah, I would say uh, the association and mentorship of people that are further along is number one. So is that why you chose the title of the talk today? 
how to win in a world that trains you to lose, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I did that. To, I put that name on there. It just came to me um, as I was going back and forth on email with you all on the talk today, because I, I think the world puts us in a box. Right. And so when I was in school growing up and, you know, I didn't fit in the little perfect box. So, you know, nobody thought I would be super successful. In fact, when my girlfriend who I'm married to now, I was kicked out at the continuation school and she was still at our high school, our senior year, the teacher pulled her aside, one of our teachers and asked her what the heck she was doing with me. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so I think there's a box that we're all put in and there's expectations. I think today, um, the world can kind of teach us to be sheep, right? Just to do exactly what everybody else is doing. Don't think outside the box. Don't ask questions. Be quiet. Shut up. Show up to work every day. And you're finding a lot of unhappy people um, because they're not finding their own way. So I think the world in general is teaching us, obviously, a lot of great principles in education, but it's also teaching us how to uh, learn and regurgitate. And sometimes it's not teaching us how to think for ourselves. Right. That's why I think this talk is so great because, you know, it gets people thinking, Hey, like I need to find my path. There's always a way, you know, there's a million people with way crazier stories than any of us that have been extremely successful. Um, but I, I think if you're willing to go outside the box, right. You're, I think the contrarian mindset, I call it the chip on your shoulder, right? Like maybe you weren't expected to be successful or maybe you're not, I think getting a little bit of a chip on your shoulder to prove the naysayers wrong is super, super important to be successful. So when the world's training everyone else to fail or lose, you're, you're taking your own path. And sometimes people are criticizing or wondering what you're doing, but when you win the championship, everybody, you know, I always say, I don't see all the Laker flags unless they're in the playoffs. Then, then, then the playoffs, everybody's got a flag in their car. You know, right. yeah. everybody loves a championship team, right? So everybody's a fan when you're winning. And so, um, you know, I think if you're, nobody wins a championship doing what everybody else does. So it's going to take some grit, determination and finding your own path to do it. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Another question. What's the next goal achievement you are working towards? Yeah, funny you ask that. Me and my wife were just talking about this morning. So we live in Irvine. We've been here 20 years and we are, uh, I'm a big surfer and we've been wanting to get to the beach. Um, and so we're going to move, we're moving to San Clemente um, towards around this time next year. So my daughter graduates high school. Um, she's at Foothill High School in North Tustin, Santa Ana area. Um, she's a swimmer there. And then when she graduates in June next year, I don't want to try to move during that crazy summertime. So October, November next year, we're going to make the move. So my goal right now is to, because San Clemente is a, is a resort beach town. So it's, it's not as, um, centrally located, right. As Irvine, Irvine's like the epicenter of everything, right. Right in the right. middle. So for me, my goal is to double our business in revenue and growth and um, create even more freedom than I have right now. And that's just going to take a, a sprint, right? I call, I call business. You're going to have times where you're walking, jogging, running, and sprinting. And so it's going to take probably a fast run slash sprint for the next 12 months to do what I need to do. But, you know, that's what gets you out of bed, right? You're going to have right. rhythms and margins, rhythms of busy times and rhythms of less busy times. And I've been, I don't want to say chill in the last couple of years, but life's been pretty good and pretty easy being semi-retired. So, yeah, getting getting on the ball and really moving to, for that move um, down to San Clemente uh, is our next goal and motivation. Wonderful. Congratulations on that. Uh, last, I have one more question here. From mentoring and coaching people, what skill do you notice people leave school without? Yeah, um, I would say what I see the most is I see a lot of people leaving school without the 
um, ability to problem solve, right? Um, they're not used to, the, you know, like I said before, I think a lot of people graduate college that they reach the pinnacle, right? Like I did it, right? Like I've been working my whole life towards graduating. Now that I've graduated, now it's time to enjoy the fruits of my labor. And you go on LinkedIn and they got a new job every nine months. And so I think uh, graduating college with the mindset that this is just the beginning, right? Like I, my little guys in jujitsu and they just had a, a belt ceremony and three black belts that day. I got to see three black belts. One took 12 years, one took 13 years, and one took 14 years of training four days a week in Brazilian jiu-jitsu to get that black belt. And one of the guys said, he said, now that I have my black belt, I, I'm just at the very beginning of um, being where I want to be, right? This is the, the black belt is the starting point of success, right? Most people see the black belt as, hey, I did it. I'm good now, I'm, you know, but a lot of people, if you look at it, you know, the success is the beginning point. You don't even really learn until you become successful what you really need to learn, right? So mm-hmm. I think um, graduating college from Long Beach State, and realizing that, hey, this was this was a great step, and I'll never forget it. It was amazing, but this is the very beginning. Now it's time to really take it to the next level and be willing to have the grit and determination and follow through that most people don't have in their early 20s to, to find something, stay on it, be consistent. I don't care how much money you make or how successful you are. If you have a new job every nine months, I'm going to look at your LinkedIn as a hiring manager and go, this is absolutely not the person I want to hire. Right. And so I think having, you know, I meet people all the time that are young and they're like, Oh, I don't really love my job. I go, yeah, that's normal. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right? right, right, Like, you, you know, you're not, you're not supposed to like love every part of it. Right. But, but having some longevity in that job, getting the skill sets to move to the next level is super necessary. Right. And, you know, being uncomfortable is part of the game. So I think being okay, being uncomfortable, having a little bit of grit, great book, by the way, Angela Duckworth, grit. I recommend it to all of you. One of my favorite books of all time that a lot of the way we were grown up and taught in a world that teaches you to fail is that talent is how people become successful. Color of your skin, talent, age, where you grew up, all that stuff. That is absolutely not a precursor to your success. Your success, a lot of it is based on grit, determination, and follow through and being willing to overcome adversity trials. Um, you know, I'm a type one diabetic. I wore an insulin pump, right? So a lot of people, you know, could use that as a reason to, you know, lay in bed all day. But I use it as a reason to be super healthy, super in shape, super on my diet and on top of it. So I think sometimes those adversities and challenges that a lot of us have had are, are the actual uh, bright spots for our future because we have that grit inside of us because of that. So long answer to a short question, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. And I was going to circle back to personal development. You know, I know you coach a lot of people and you just mentioned the book here. Any tips, suggestions on how, you know, our students or alumni could work on their personal development when you could say they are working right they're they're hitting the pavement every day and they're in an unhappy job like how could they better themselves to be where you're at today yeah and so number one i heard the quote years ago from jim Rohn. he said everybody wants more but very few people are willing to do the work to be more themselves right everybody's looking for external circumstances to help them make more money be better but it's 100% internal, right? If you look behind me, right? I, you know, I got half of my bookshelf. I read hundreds and hundreds of books, not because I'm smart. Remember, I got kicked out of high school, but because I was driven and determined to figure out how these people thought. And if you had the answers to the test already in a book, right? Why not read it before you take the test? And so today we're also caught up in our, you know, uh, I call it, you know, distractions and entertainment, right? That we're not putting the time and energy towards self, towards ourselves. So I would give everyone the best advice when you graduate 
is that, like I said, you're at the starting point of your career. If you want to rise above the crowd, because remember, you're going to be at a company where everybody has a college degree. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so what makes you bet? What makes you different? And so you need to have the, I call it the daily five, right? Which is uh, reading, right? Every day I read. There's not a day that goes by that before I go to bed, I don't read. Now, if you fall asleep when you read, read in the morning, right? So every day I read, every day I listen to something, right? So listening could be a podcast, could be an audio, could be whatever, could be one minute, could be 30 minutes, right? And I don't mean I'm listening to the debates of the next presidential election that makes me mad. I listen to things that are, right, that are helping me get to where I want to go, the way you think, all that. Reading, listening, uh, seeing, right? So you know, you, you learn with your eyes, you learn with your ears, right? You learn very little with your mouth, right? Yeah. Hard for me is being a very talkative person. Um, and so an association. So let allowing myself to be mentored, having conversations with other people, people that are coaching me, um, asking for advice, you know, um, and then for me also, I love to book in my day, start my day in control of my day end my day and control my day. So starting the morning, if you get up at 7 a.m. every day, change your style and get up at 6 or 6.30, right? Changing the beginning of your day. Remember, if you start your mornings in control of your day, reading, audio, get the mind filled with positivity, staying off social media on your phone, start your day that way, right? And then ending your day reading, right? getting the subconscious mind thinking positive, right? It, because it all, the world is trying to bring us down with negativity. News, social media, it's a given fact. It's, it's, it's teaching us to be unhappy with ourselves. So you have to really put energy into your growth. And a lot of that comes from reading, listening, talking, and um controlling your day with the input into your brain you have to physically put your phone away yeah like you have it has to go away for times of the day to keep your creativity and and your your motivation high thank you for that so i think we're close to our time and i have one question in the chat here what are your favorite three to five books you would recommend to someone to read yeah, well, Grit, I told you Grit by Angela Duckworth. That's a great one, especially if you're still in school. She talks a lot about schooling in that book. Right behind me, uh, one of my favorite books um, I've read the last couple of years, Win the Day by Mark Batterson, right? It's got a very Christian bent to it, so I will warn you. Uh, he's a pastor, but this is probably one of my favorite books I've read the last four or five years. It just, Win the Day, Seven Habits right? To help you stress less and accomplish more. It's just, it's a great daily. Um, Anything John Maxwell, right? I'm a huge John Maxwell fan. I see him speak a couple times a year. So he's got, I think John's written a hundred books. He's the number one leadership speaker, writer in the world. So any of his books, right? Uh, 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership is his number one bestseller ever. But what you'll find if you're not a big reader, and you really want to get that habit going, I would highly recommend it. Um, Start with John. John C. Maxwell. He's a huge uh, Amazon bestseller. All his books are so readable, so conversational, um, not super cerebral, um, and they'll get you moving. Now, if you're not a big reader, start off reading one page a day, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't read because they feel like they can't. If you read one page a day, Every day for a month, that's 30 days, 30 pages. You can up it to two, right? Like you don't need to overwhelm yourself with some crazy book that like you don't even understand. And then it sits, you know, next to your bed for the next 10 years. So I would say anything John Maxwell, um, I got a million books on here, but I'd say top three grit, anything John Maxwell. And I really highly recommend Win the Day by Mark Batterson. Um are, are, are great places to start. So I know we're up against time. So my final question, two questions is, 
what advice do you have for our, our students and our alumni that are interested in hopefully one day being like you? And then um, also if, you know, in the future, if any of our students or alumni that are watching this, if they could uh, reach out to you via possibly LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and I coach a lot of people. So, you know, if anyone ever reaches out, has questions, I'm a huge pay it forward person. That's what I do. Um, so I'm on LinkedIn. You guys will get that. Uh, if you search my name on LinkedIn, I think it's actually LinkedIn forward slash Kevin Stroh. So that's easy. Um, but I would just say best advice is all my, all the things I told you to, together um, is number one is finish. <laughs> I, had million, I had a million friends that went to college that didn't graduate. So you're there, you put the time, you put the money, you put the energy, finish it up. Right. right. Um, don't settle when you graduate. Right. Um, I think your first job out of college can be, can be a great stepping stone. I knew a lot of people that just took some, some position because they thought it would be great or, you know, they weren't thinking of their career in mind. So I always tell people when you graduate, that first job out of college is a big stepping stone because a lot of times we end up in that career or field that we started out of college, right? I could have done a million other things and I would have took a totally different trajectory and path. So make sure that you're, you know, going in the right direction. Don't chase money, chase the industry you want to be in, right? And the money will always follow um, if you're doing the things that fire you up, right? Um, if I had to teach math, I don't care if they paid me a million dollars a year, I'd fail. <laughs> so it's not just about money. Money is a, is a tool to pay back so you can get some of your time. But success, I always tell people if everybody hated you and you had $10 million, it wouldn't matter, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if you had great relationships and everybody loved you and you only had $10,000, you'd be much happier. So money is important, but it's a tool, right? It's not the only thing. So find find, don't just chase the money when you graduate. And then last thing is uh, realize if you ever want to take control of your life at some point, you have to be an entrepreneur, but that doesn't mean you need to take a lot of risk. It doesn't mean you need to quit your job and it doesn't mean you need to have all this money to invest into something. Those are misnomers I run into all the time, right? Take some of your unproductive time on the side, right? Stop doing what everybody else is doing, which is entertaining themselves to death, right? And start something, get involved in something, get into a network group, get around other people, right? If it's real estate, start getting around people that are successful in real estate, right? Mm -hmm. But don't quit your job to become a real estate agent. That is, I used to sell to realtors and they'd all have $50,000 on their credit card crying to me that they, and I'm like, why'd you quit your job? Like real estate can be, it should be a total side hustle until you're making hundreds of thousands of dollars where it doesn't make sense to work anymore. But when does real estate run? Nights and weekends, right? When does my business want run? Nights and weekends, right? So you can fill your days working and paying your bills and not being stressed out. But if you want to get ahead, you need to do more. You need to become more. Right. And you got to be willing to, while you're young, healthy with the most energy you'll ever have, you need to start as early as you can. Because by the time you're 40, you're going to be driving a minivan and you're not going to do anything. So start now in your 20s, when you're healthy, when life is less complicated, start getting used to that craziness, I call, of having more than one thing going on. I think it'll serve you well. Even if you're an engineer and you're doing side things as an engineer, I find that hugely beneficial. Mm -hmm. well well, and grit, right? We talked about grit this whole, yeah. you know. And when awesome. you read that book, you'll hear it because it talks a lot about college and schooling and, you know, all these kids that, you know, maybe weren't picked to be the, at the top school that end up being like wildly successful because they had grit, they had follow through determination and they never quit. Well, thank you, Kevin, so much for joining us today and sharing your journey uh, of resilience and congratulations on the very successful career congratulations on the beautiful family and we're very excited that you're part of the alumni family and we can't wait to see what's next for you uh for everyone joining thank you so much for for joining us just a reminder to follow us on social media 
uh, for our future chats and any other events hosted by CSUB alumni. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Kevin, if you want to hold on while we end the call.